Thanks everybody. So um, a quick um, introduction to myself. I worked for GE for 10 plus years, nearly 11 years. Um, so overall I have 25 years experience working for companies like uh, BP and DHL uh, as well as GE. My speciality is uh, OD, Organization Development, Leadership Development. Uh, and as a part of that, for the last two years in GE, I got uh, asked to get involved with Eric Rees. Eric came along and, and supported GE in getting trained by him to become uh, a trainer and a coach of the Lean Startup Principles. So GE, uh, four or five years ago, brought Eric in, really liked his ideas and said, this is something we need to be doing. So as a part of that, the learning community got involved. We were trained by him. We then went out and started training. So my job, I looked after the oil and gas business. I went out and trained a thousand managers over two years on the Lean Startup Principles. The idea being that we try and embed this into GE going forward. Now I'm an independent coach. I left GE in November. Uh, my role really is to, is to help uh, small businesses, startups, take the ideas from Eric's book and use it to help them make better decisions around do we carry on with this, uh, with this venture or not? So, startup failure rate. This is the stats, uh, sorry, it's US based, but these are the stats that, uh, that are, are used in, in GE as well. Uh, Shane Scott, uh, Scott Shane has said, look, you know, a, a typical new business started in the United States is no longer in operation five years after being founded. So you can see the fallout rate of startup businesses is huge, right? In the first year, 25% drop out of the 75% that are left, another 35% drop out in year two, and by year three, the attrition rate is huge. So what you're seeing from this data is that companies, startup companies are, are okay in the first year, but then really come unstuck years two and three. So, you know, a lot of you are in the startup position at the moment, so your first year might've been great, but years two and three are gonna be tough. What can we do to help with that? Well, it's no different for new product launches. So GE is a large company, it's not a startup company, it's not an entrepreneurial company, but it launches products, thousands of products a year. So you can imagine each product is like a startup, it's a brand new launch into the market with the hope, fingers crossed, that it'll be successful. But the stats again from, from these professors is not good. 30,000 new consumer products launched each year, 95% of them fail. Uh, you know, from Acupol, somewhere between 80 to 90% or 95% of new product introductions fail. So that's the stats. I'm sure it's very similar here in UK and Europe. Uh, and so you're, you're up against it. GE was no different. Nine out of 10 of its products that were launched failed. So let me qualify what I mean by failure. The prediction was it was going to be a $20 million product. It ended up being a $2 million product. So it's not a failure in the fact that they, you know, it, it was a washout, but it no way reached its predicted volume and predicted sales and predicted uh, contribution. And so we have hundreds and hundreds of these products that are $2 million, $3 million bobbing along, but never becoming the $20, $30, $40 million products that we predicted that it would become. Uh, and Jeff Immelt was very frustrated with this, and so he, he got in touch with Eric and, and said, hey, tell me about this. Eric at the time it still is. Uh, you know, visiting professor of entrepreneurship at Harvard University. Uh, and Eric uh, really guided GE into a different way of thinking. Four years later, we're seeing the benefits. We're actually seeing in GE huge differences in our new product success rates. So, GE needed a game changer. We had tried the Las Vegas products. The products that are so technically advanced it's no use showing it to the customer. The customer won't get it. They don't understand the technology. We'll just build hundreds of them. We'll fill the warehouse and then we'll sell it. And the customers will come running because it's such a great product. So that's what we turned the Las Vegas product. You know, Las Vegas was built in the desert and everyone thought you guys are mad. No one's gonna drive two hours into the desert to go to, go to the city. They still built it on faith, on good faith, and it took off. Nearest example I can give would be something like, um, something like the iPad or the iPhone. People thought, hey, it's been done, it's been tried, no other people have tried it, it'll never work. Apple, you're crazy, why are you doing this? Somehow they managed to make it work. Yeah? So we, we have tried many times with the Las Vegas products, spent millions of dollars, uh, you know, hoping to wow the market and always failing. 
The other issue they have is, look, we are spreading our resources too thin. We've got hundreds of ideas, hundreds of potential ideas, and we're, we're we, you know, a limited research and development budget. You know, we don't know which of these hundred ideas will be successful and which will fail. If we could find some quick way of being able to recognize which ideas will work, which ideas won't work, then we can stop investing in the ideas that are duff, the ideas that will fail. So there was a big push in GE to move towards that. If we know nine out of 10 ideas will fail, and here this is, a, this is an example where we've looked at new product development costs for potentially 10 new products. Typically what happens in large companies, you have to put together a business plan. The business plan would say, hey, can you give us X million dollars? We want to invest in that to produce this new product. It's gonna take 18 months, two years to develop that product. Um, and then the business will sign off on that and say, yeah, absolutely, we'll give you 5 million, 6 million, 10 million, whatever the number is. And then they start working towards plan. The old way of working before Eric Ries came along, they would spend two years building the first product, spend $7 million building it, and then find it was a failure. And the money's sunk, the money's gone, we've lost everything. Now, using Eric's approach, within a very short space of time, we're talking about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 million, we reach a point where we can say, this is not a good idea. The indicators are, the, the market's not ready, the customer is not willing to pay the price, whatever the factors are, let's stop. So the advantage of using Eric's approach is that in a lot of cases, we were able to switch off products that would invariably fail. We were able to find out within three months, six months, which products would fail, and then switch off the R&D, re the research and development uh, spend on that, and move it to the product that would succeed the one product out of 10 that would succeed. So GE's game changer is not being, we're gonna make products better. We're still gonna make products, and nine out of 10 will still fail, but we found a quicker way of finding out which nine will fail within six months or 12, uh, three months we found that out. So the net result is we have a budget of XX million to spend on research and development. The old model would have been well, we can only fund half a dozen new product developments. Um, we'll build them, it'll take two years, and after we built it, then we'll go out to the marketplace and hope that it sells. The new way has been, we've still only got XX million dollars of, of R&D budget, but using Eric's approach, we were able to more wisely switch off the products that won't work and then spend it on the products that will, will work. So that has been the approach. So, a lot of the old methods were, were, were removed. So this is the old kind of approach that, that a lot of large companies, you probably recognize if you've worked in a large company, would use. So they would listen to the customer's problem and the customer would say, hey, I really need a widget that could do this. And then we would say, okay, got you. Then we would maybe turn our back on the customer, internally get together and come up with an idea or a concept that can uh, develop the widget for the customer because of intellectual property issues, we wouldn't share this idea with the customer. We keep it internal because it's very sensitive. It gives us a cutting edge. Why would we go back and tell the customer? But we're gonna work on that. Then we create the business case. And the business case is the big hurdle. So that's the one where you put together numbers that justify the $7 million research and development spend or the $10 million research and development spend. Um, the business case invariably will ask for contribution margin, return on investments, and all of that. So then the product managers work towards the business case. The business case, once, in, once it's in, approved by the business, becomes the driver. So although GE followed the new, development, uh, new product development process, a very robust, very rigorous NPD, which would look at um, look, you know, uh, step one would be we'd do this, step two would be do this, very much similar to Prince project management. So the new product development process is a very rigorous process. And there were toll gates all the way through the, with the process. At the toll gates at the review meetings, we were expecting leaders to put their hands up and say, hey, you know what, this is not gonna work, let's stop. But the leaders are being driven by the business case. Oh my God, it's being built into next year's budget. Uh, the business case is that we have to produce this product. It has to sell 20,000 in the first quarter because it's been budgeted into the, cap in, into the operating expenditure for next year. We've got to make this work. Let's push it through. So the new product development toll gate system was failing. 
So we ended up two years down the road, three years down the road, mass producing widgets, not having gone back to the customer and validated with the customer, is this still what you want? Are we on the right track? Once we built, fill, filled the warehouse with these widgets, then we would go back to the customer and say, hey, how many do you want to place? How many orders do you want to place? And the customer would say, if only you'd come to me 18 months ago, two years ago, we would have said, whoa, whoa stop. That's not the burning issue. Don't waste your money on that. We won't buy it anyway. If only you'd shared with us the pricing structure, because we ain't going to pay $8,000. Our budget was $2,000. Why didn't you talk to us? Or the worst case scenario, you know what? You're six months too late. We've already gone and placed an order with a competitor. So that was the old way of doing things. A quick show of hands, people who've worked in big businesses, did you recognize that? A few nods, right? So it's a very typical way of doing it. So Eric came in and really blew it up. And we bought into this hook, line, and sinker. So a lot of this terminology, minimum viable product, you know, pivot and persevere, that's now part of the language in GE. So he came in, this young 30-something guy, talking to very experienced uh, research and development people. And they were really kind of, what is this guy? Come on, who's, what, what's he going to tell us? But then he really made us stop and think about it. So the whole idea of you build prototypes, you then measure by showing it to the customers, seeing how they respond to that prototype, then get to a decision point, do we pivot or persevere? In GE's case, there's another one, pivot, persevere, or pull. Right? Do we actually pull the product because it doesn't make sense? And this has really been our savior. So we are still failing in the fact that we're still making nine out of 10 products that won't actually make, make us any money, but we're failing fast and we're switching off the products that won't make any money. So for the startup entrepreneurs in the room, imagine how powerful it is if you can find out within six months if your product is viable. For the VCs in the room, Imagine how important it is to know you're backing somebody or a product that's actually going to be successful in the marketplace. So this is really, really powerful stuff. So let's just get into the detail. Some of the lessons learned. First thing Eric did when he came in, he said, set up a, a VC board. You know, similar to the Shark Tank, similar to Dragon's Den, have a bunch of senior leaders sitting with a, literally a pot of money and then have the guys come in and pitch. And so that's what he did. He set that VC board up. Some of the running rules are only small amounts of money because you want to test out and, uh, and prove or disprove your, your hypothesis or your assumptions. So we're not going to give you a million dollars. We're going to give you 50,000, 50, 10,000, small amounts of money. And that forces the team to come back every six weeks to report back what they found or not found to ask for more money. And every six or 12 weeks, the team had to go in front with their recommendation. Do we pivot? Do we persevere? Or do we pull the product? So within six, 12 weeks, maximum 24 weeks, we were on a go, no go point. So that was the power of using Eric's approach. We weren't waiting 18 months, two years, building something and then finding there's no market for it. We were very quickly able to find out is there a market? Are there enough customers interested? Are they willing to pay at the price point that we want to sell it at? If not, these are all showstoppers. So the, the internal VC board is a really, really powerful tool. Another learning is that you know, we stopped making products and then trying to find a market. So we really went back to, let's go and talk to the customer. Let's understand actually what the customer's issue is. right? Instead of getting all excited about the sexy new technology, let's actually find out, well, what is it that the, the, the customer, what problem does the customer have? How can we solve for that? So too often in the past, we would produce this very, very technically astute product and then not find any customers that are interested. So we really reversed that and put the customer first. The next one we looked at is we just accepted that nine out of 10 solutions would fail. We just needed to fail fast. So six weeks, 12 weeks, rather than six months, 12 months. So that's the idea that within a very short space of time, we get to the go, no go decision. And then um, understand what are the critical few leap of faith assumptions? What are the critical few assumptions that will make or break the deal? 
So we, we, you know, typically when, when, I, when I coach the team and we'll go through this, it would, we would end up with 80, 90 assumptions. Well, those 80 or 90 assumptions are not critical. We just needed to find the critical few and test them out very quickly in the first six weeks, the first 12 weeks. And then accept that learning metrics are a gray area. So we would set an learning metric to say, we're gonna go and talk to 10 customers. We expect at least eight out of 10 to say, yes, I love the product, I'll place my order. And then the learning metric would come back and say, you know what? Four customers said yes, they'd place an order. What do we do? It's not an automatic kill, but is it enough to persevere and carry on building the product? We were expecting eight out of 10 to love this product, but only four have loved it. So that's what the VC board would have that discussion about. Do we still fund this? Is it still worth building? So learning metrics are not unlike scientists, black or white. You know, it's not, it's not as clear as that. Learning metrics are a gray area where we're not sure whether we have enough of an interest from customers to carry on building the product. And the final one, we still needed the rigor of toll gates and new product development once the decision has been made to carry on. So you can imagine GE is making heart monitors, CT scanners, airplane engines. We need to build to the highest quality. So the initial stages when we're showing the prototype, showing the working model, showing even a, a video of what, what the product will look like, that's okay. It can be quick and dirty, it can be you know, rough. Once we have enough customer orders saying, yes, we want to buy this, then we have to go into the toll gate process and we build to the GE quality. In the case of aircraft engines, it's not six sigma, it's 10 sigma. Nobody wants an aircraft engine to fail when they're on a plane. So we have to work to those standards. So that's where the toll gate system would come back in. So it's a merging of, let's use Eric's approach to test the market and see if there is a market. Once we know there is a market, let's go back to the toll gate system and make sure we build the standard. Okay. So the fundamentals. The fundamentals are identify and train the team. In Eric's book, he talks about having a dedicated team. It's very unlikely you're going to have a dedicated team if you're a large organization, but at least identify who from legal is going to be joining the team, who from ops is going to join the team, who from sourcing will be joining the team. Once the team had been put together, uh, my job was to train the team on, on Eric's principles, Eric's ideas, so they don't walk out of the workshop being confused about what is an MVP or being confused about what is a loafer. They needed to understand the concepts that were core to the Lean Startup approach. Then we identify coaches. So the coaches went through rigorous training with, uh, you know, with me, with Eric, uh, to really understand their role. Uh, anyone familiar with uh, the Lean Six Sigma approach, the black belts, master black belts? So we didn't call them black belts or master black belts, but it's the same concept. The coaches were there to help projects. They weren't technically the best. They didn't have to know the technical ins and outs of the product being built, but they needed to be able to coach and help the, through the process to say, okay guys, let's come up with the leap of faith assumptions. Okay, let's start gridding the leap of faith assumptions into most important, least important. Okay, what experiments are we gonna do to prove or disprove these leap of faith assumptions? So the coaches are essential to the success of, of the rollout in GE. And then we also needed to separate the real new product development from product extensions, the me too products. So what would happen often is that we've had a product that's been around for 20 years in the market, a competitor adds a bell or a whistle, our customers ring up and say, hey, they've got a bell, why don't you put a bell on ours? And that's fine, but that's not new product development. That's an enhancement of an existing product, and that will, it does not make sense to put Eric's methodology through that approach. So very clearly separate out the new product development from uh, product enhancements. Because the methodology works for a brand new to product to, to market, never ever seen before product. Okay? So the process steps. First of all, the coach, ha ha ha, very important. I would say that, given that I'm putting myself forward as a coach. So the coach is very important. Train the coach, have the coach there. They do not need to be subject matter experts. They need to be process matter experts. They need to understand the steps and be able to coach the team through the steps. Step one, identify the customer challenge. So one of the things uh, in the VC board that Eric sits on, he doesn't understand the technology in GE at all. He doesn't want to understand the technology in GE. His first question would be, 
How many customers have you had? We'd have product managers saying, have I got a product here? Can I have the funding for this product? It can do this, it can do that, it can do this. And Eric would say, well, have you shown it to the customer? Which problem are you solving for the customer? No, 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 but it can do this, it can do that. And he said, no, 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 but which problem are you solving for the customer? I don't know, well then go away. Go away, talk to the customer, understand what is the customer's challenge, then come back and explain how your product is gonna solve that challenge. Okay? So number two, brainstorm multiple solutions. What we've learned is that customers, we would, we would you know, finesse the one solution, the one idea we've come up with, and in the first half an hour of discussions with a the customer, they would kick it out and say, no, we don't like that. What else have you got? And then we'd kind of rabbit in the headlights, oh, we got nothing. <laughs> and go away quickly and come up with an alternative solution because we were so sure the customer would like the first solution. So the key learning there is make sure you have multiple solutions to the customer problem. Number three is identify all the assumptions behind each solution. This is the hard work, guys. This is where the coach earns the money. So there's gonna be 80 or 90 assumptions typically bubbling out if you do it properly. Some of those assumptions are not important, some of the assumptions are critical. So I'm gonna come back to that point later on. Um, then set the learning metrics, slightly different from Eric's book. So before you conduct the experiment, you say, look, I'm going to test out if the customer is willing to accept this new technology in this industry. I'm going to go to at least 10 customers, 100 customers, and I expect at least 8 out of 10, 7 out of 10 to say, yes, they love it. So set the learning metrics first, um, then conduct the experiment. You'll see how I'm avoiding using the word MVP. Again, in GE, what they tend to use is say it's a market validation process. Right? We're validating with the market that what we have or the assumption that we've made is true or not true. So it's an experiment. Right? Like classic scientists, you have a theory or an assumption, you then devise an experiment to prove or disprove that assumption. And I'll come on to that with some real life genuine examples shortly. And then the final one is have that pivot, pull, persevere discussion. In Eric's book, he talks about pivot or persevere, pivot or persevere. Don't give up. You have a vision to reach this, to make this for the customer. Try multiple times to get there. And GE's world, we say, well, no, there are times when you say, it's not worth the effort, we'll pull. We will focus somewhere else. Our dollars are spent doing something else. So in Eric's book, it's not as clear as that. He kind of gives the view that you should never give up. The reality of it is, you often need to give up because the market's just not big enough. The customers are not willing to pay, pay, um, you know, pay the margins that you're looking for. So you have to pull away. It's probably technically a great product, and some customers might buy it, but it's never gonna become a $20 million product line. Okay? So let me just go back and talk a little bit about identifying all the assumptions behind each solution. As I say, the coach's job there, uh, and, and I'll go on to this one in the experiments uh, at, at the close. So the coach's job is really to take all the assumptions that have been made and then capture it into this high impact and uh, it's just kind of impact ease matrix. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. But what is the impact of this assumption, leap of faith assumption, on the success of the startup? Is it high or is it low? How easy will it be to test out this assumption? Okay, is it going to be easy to test out the assumption or is it going to be hard to test out the assumption? Clearly, I don't think the colors have come through too well. The ones at the top are the assumptions you need to test out and from the get-go. The other assumptions at the bottom that have low impact, you can test out later. So. Can you give us a couple of examples of assumptions? Sure. So uh, I'm, stealing, I'm stealing examples from my earlier slide, from my next slide. But an example would be, we have made an assumption that the customer is willing to accept this new polycarbohydrate uh, product in this industry in the healthcare industry, in the aeronautical industry, whatever the industry is, right? We, you know, if we don't test out that assumption and get from the get-go, that would be a high impact, easy to test. Go and talk to a dozen customers, whether it's Boeing, whether it's whoever, and say, we're thinking of changing from steel, uh, steel rotors to this, to this, to this uh, metal mix. Uh, are you okay with that? Would you be comfortable with that? What do we need to do to get you comfortable with that? So that would be an assumption that is critical to success 
which needs to be tested out early. Right? Another real life example would be an assumption that was made is that the salespeople would be okay selling this product. Never was tested. Then when we made the product and gave it to the sales guys to sell it, they said, what? <laughs> and then the whole of the, of the project stalled because we had to stop and retrain the salespeople on the technology behind the product in order for them to be comfortable to sell it. So these assumptions, sometimes some of them are easy and some of them are hard, they need to be tested out. So the job is not just come up with assumptions. One of the assumptions, low impact, easy to test, they want the button on the left or they want the button on the right. Right? What difference does it make? That is not a showstopper assumption. If you find out, you assume they wanted it on the left and then you find out, no, they actually want the button on the right, that is not going to stop you from making the product. Okay? But if you find that the client or customer is not willing to accept the technology, the alloy, the metal, I mean, we're an industrial business, so a lot of alloys, metals, you know, material science is involved. If the customer is not willing to accept that, then that becomes a showstopper. So let me expand a little bit more. So this is what I mean by having the right uh, assumptions and the right uh, tests to, to measure that. So the experiments or the MVP prove or disprove the assumptions, the critical assumptions. Okay, so here are some, uh, some examples. The assumption is we can get large supplies of this raw material. We're going to be making lots and lots of these big machines. We can get this new raw material. It's new to the industry. We can get lot, lots of this raw material. Well, the test was, let's get supply chain involved, let's get sourcing involved, and talk to suppliers, our usual suppliers of these raw materials. Lo and behold, we find that actually there's only one supplier that can guarantee to provide the raw material. So that becomes a showstopper. No matter how much the customer likes the product, if we can't get supply of the raw material to make the product, we're in trouble. The risk involved in only having one global supplier who can provide that product is huge for a company like GE. We would never do it. So then we say, move to a different material. Right? We haven't killed it, but we pivoted to an alternative material because the existing material just is too risky. We don't have enough supplies of it. We don't have enough assured supplies of it, so we kill it up. So we have to pivot to something else. We assumed in one case the customer was motivated by a capex reduction. This machine is 15%, 20% cheaper than our competitors. We assume that customers would love that and queue up to buy it. Wrong assumption. When we went to the customers, they said, yeah, it's good, it's a 15 or 20% reduction, but this machine lasts for 10 years. What's the operating standard day in, month in, month out, year in operating costs? Can you not reduce that by 10%? Because then we'd be interested. So again, we really have to stop and say, okay, stop wasting our time trying to make a cheaper widget. Let's actually make a widget that's higher quality, more reliable, less likely to break down, because that's what the customer wants, the operating expenditure to go down. So you imagine the saving to the customer of not having to take this thing offline every year and, and service it, because it's good enough to be serviced every two years or every three years. Huge operating expenditure saving for the customer. But we had assumed and gone in thinking, oh, well, it's going to be 15, 20% cheaper than our competitors. Customers will be queuing up to buy it. So we made a huge mistake making that assumption. The other example, customers are willing to pay, I've made up the figures, but, you know, $8,000 per widget. And then we went along uh, and spoke to a whole bunch of customers, and they said, no, our, our price point is 2000 8000 is too much. So then that, be, that was a kind of decision to say, hey, let's stop. We can build it, absolutely, but we're going to build it at such a point that it's too high for customers to buy. So we shouldn't even build it. We just have to say to the customer, thanks very much. You know, we can't help you here. Okay? And the final example was, you know, uh, didn't even enter our heads to go and talk and, and, and meet, meet the government watchdog. So we didn't test it. We put the product on the market. And then the government watchdog said, whoa, whoa, hold on. You know, that goes against our regs here. You didn't ask us. We're not saying no. We're just saying you should have spoken to us two years ago before you started building this thing. And so that really slowed down the product launch. So sometimes we miss the assumption. Sometimes these assumptions are, we don't even see, 
and they ca catch his blind side and they can derail the whole project. Okay. So um, that is the end of my presentation. I'm under time rather than over time, so apologies for that.